welcome to you today. I'm Paul Pepys, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Sarah Deer, professor of law at the University of Kansas School of Law. Deer has worked to end violence against women for over 20 years, beginning as a volunteer advocate for rape victims. Her scholarship focuses on the intersection of federal Indian law and victims' rights. A citizen of the Muscogee Creek Nation of Oklahoma, Deer is co-author of three textbooks on tribal law. Her latest book is The Beginning and End of Rape, Confronting Sexual Violence in Native America. She is the recipient of a 2014 MacArthur Fellowship. On June 9, 2017, Deer gave a talk at the U of O's Many Nations Longhouse titled The Nonfiction Version of the Roundhouse, A History of Sexual Violence in Indian Country. The university's 2017-18 Common Reading for Incoming First Year Students is Louise Erdrich's novel, The Roundhouse. Thank you, Sarah, for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Why don't we start at the beginning. Tell us a little bit about your background and how it led to your career in law and the academy, and in particular, your specialization in the law. Um, it's, it's an interesting story. I, um, as you mentioned, was a rape crisis advocate uh, for about six years. And during that time period, I had the opportunity to attend somewhere between 12 and 20 um, rape trials hmm. um, in Lawrence, Kansas. And watching those trials unfold, I was very taken by the skills of the prosecutors as well as how victims experienced those trials. So my instinct was to go to law school to become a sex crimes prosecutor. Mm -hmm. And that was really my intent. So I really focused heavily on criminal law. Along the way, though, I was exposed to federal Indian law, which is interesting because even as a Native person, I did not know the depths of the complexities mm -hmm. in federal Indian law. So I began to be fascinated by that area of law as well. So I tried to figure out a way to find an intersection there. Mm -hmm. um, and the intersection presented pr quite quickly when I learned that Native women are the most likely uh, to be raped in the United States. And so there was quickly a synergy there between the two topics that I was passionate about. Um, so I didn't ever become a sex crimes mm -hmm, prosecutor. Mm -hmm. uh, I did a number of interesting things, including working for the federal government and working for a nonprofit. Uh, and that led me eventually to teaching, which was not on the radar until uh, very recently, actually. So you mentioned that you discovered that um, sexual violence, the highest rates of sexual violence are against Native American women. Yes. So give us a sense of what those statistics are. So the most recent data that we have comes from the Department of Justice, and the federal government, and it's a report in a, about a year ago, in May of 2016. It's the most recent data we have, but it's consistent with the last, say, 15 years of data. Um, and in that um, report called American Indians um, and Crime, uh, the, the researchers concluded that over 50% of Native women will experience some form of sexual violence in her lifetime, and over 80% will experience some form of violence, um, maybe not sexual violence, but a physical assault. So um, it's more common than not for a Native woman to experience violence. And how do those statistics uh, uh, compare with the rest of the American population? Well, it's uh, definitely elevated. Depending, mm -hmm. on the, uh, depending on the study, mm -hmm. Native people experience two and a half times the rate mm -hmm. of violence compared to the mainstream American population. So in general, can you speak to who the perpetrators of this violence against uh, American Indian women are? Sure. Um, the, the, and this is a little bit of a, a complicated area because the data we have is national in scope and it's not regional mm -hmm. and so there are so many variations uh, depending on where you are mm -hmm. and what kind of reservation we're talking about. But on the national level, um, most perpetrators are actually non-native. Mm. That's particularly concerning when you know that in American criminology, most violent crime is what we call uh, intra-racial. Mm -hmm. So somebody who's a victim is more likely than not to have a perpetrator of the same race. Hmm. The only exception to that is Native people. Both Native men and women report that the majority of their perpetrators are non-Native. So that's concerning on a number of levels. Um, but it's also just the, an, an anomaly, hmm. um, a curious anomaly at that. Um, <coughs> but those, those data sets include urban areas as well. Mm -hmm. And so you're seeing, you know, we don't know for sure if that's the case in Indian country, but we do know that on a national level, 
Native women and men are reporting that the vast majority of their perpetrators are members of a different race. I know that some commentators uh, have used the term epidemic to describe this uh, trend of violence against Native people. You don't, you, you're skeptical of the use of the term mm -hmm. epidemic, say why. Well, I think my first reaction became, was a, around just, it became so ubiquitous. Everybody was using this word epidemic, mm -hmm. including myself. Mm -hmm. And I really started to interrogate that when I started working on the book. And I said, is that really what this is about? Epidemic to me um, applies to biological things that are germs or uh, bacteria that are causing a high rate of uh, crime or a high rate of disease like HIV mm -hmm. or um, uh, smallpox in the case of the of the Indian people mm -hmm. um, historically um, but but what we're talking about when we talk about sexual violence it's not a disease it's not something that is biological mm -hmm. it's not something that we need medicine for and I feel that when we use that term even though I think it's well meant and it gets attention right um, is that um, we're, we're depoliticizing it mm -hmm. in a sense Mm -hmm. We're saying it's sort of something that we can't control. Um, so I, I want to push back on that term a little bit. We still hear it a lot, and I find myself sometimes it slips out when mm -hmm. I'm talking mm -hmm. about the issue. Um, but I, I want to I push back on that a little bit and, and sort of make sure we're, we're identifying this high rate of sexual violence as a political issue and mm -hmm. not a biological one. And they're human agents that are culpable for these. Exactly. Mm -hmm. not, not germs, mm -hmm. um, but people. <laughs> okay. So the title of the book, uh, is the beginning and the end of rape. Help, help us understand why you, what you mean by that, the beginning and the end. It was a tough title to come up with. Um, I had a couple of ideas and the publisher encouraged me to think a little more critically about what would be on the cover of the book. Mm -hmm. um, and I decided that the journey of my book really starts at um, the beginning of Native women's encounter with European men. Mm -hmm. And that is when sexual violence became introduced to Native communities on a wide scale. I always want to be cautious that, you know, I'm not suggesting that rape didn't exist before contact, but it certainly um, became introduced on a wide scale. And so um, we can identify the beginning of rape on this continent in the sense of it being a crisis. Mm. Um, and if we can identify the origin, um, then my aspiration Mm -hmm. is that we can identify what needs to happen to end it. And I believe that it's not just about Native women, mm -hmm. but if we can identify the origin and the solution for violence against Native women, I believe that's going to instruct how we end rape altogether. Hmm. So you've begun to get at my next question already. You argue at one point in the book that rape is a fundamental result of colonialism, a history of violence reaching back centuries. You've begun to talk about that in a kind of historical way. Say a little bit more about how you understand that. Well, when we look at the uh, initial contact, as going as far back as Columbus, mm -hmm. um, we see um, rape introduced almost immediately, in the second voyage in particular. Mm -hmm. And um, there's an entitlement, there's a sense of um, uh, arrogance, colonial arrogance that I landed here, I have a flag and I have a cross and that means I can do what I want. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that is indeed what happened. And it continued throughout you know, the next four centuries um, that European men in particular, not all European men, but by and large, um, the, the rape that was happening was committed by European men. Um, and that's what we have to identify and claim if we're gonna be really honest about this crime. And certainly, you know, as women started coming to this continent, mm -hmm. they didn't initially, mm -hmm. um, uh, they were being raped as well mm -hmm. because in Europe, women were property. Mm -hmm. Contrast that with native cultures where women had agency and political power and those kinds of things. But, um, but, but yes, it was, a, I believe, rape as a wide scale phenomenon was introduced by colonialism. And you, you, when you say we know this, what, what's the evidence that this that this history is based on? I mean, are these testimonies from the colonizers themselves? Yes. Oh, mm -hmm. fascinating. So if you read the journals of the, um, particularly the second voyage mm -hmm. um, with Columbus, um, they kept journals, they kept, they wrote letters, right? Hmm. And some of those things are still accessible. Hmm. And they talk about being a rapist. Hmm. They, they they brag about it. Hmm. Um, and then when you start looking um, through, particularly, let's say, the 18th and 19th century, mm -hmm. a lot of the information we have, frankly, comes from missionaries mm -hmm. who kept 
detailed documentation, right, right. and particularly on the Trail of Tears, mm -hmm. which is a, a mm -hmm. phenomenon that, that affected my people as well, um, the missionaries who came, who were sympathetic, uh, to Native people um, wrote about the mass atrocities that were happening, including sexual assault. So it's not just a matter of Native people saying, we, we know this from our sort of histories, mm -hmm. not th uh, that should be sufficient, right? Mm -hmm. But, but there, uh, there's heavy documentation of this being a widespread phenomenon coming from observers who are not Native. Mm. So you, you, um, you also expand the argument and you, you claim that there are like essential parallels between colonialism and rape. Say a little bit more about that. Well, this really, this idea um, really is a result of my thinking about what rape victims go through. Mm -hmm. um, as an advocate for rape victims and as somebody who's, I've probably spoken to over four or 500 Native women over the years who have experienced sexual violence, um, there, are, there are specific tactics that are very common. There's isolation, mm -hmm. humiliation, mm -hmm. um, degradation. Um, there's just a vast variety of tools that a rapist will use including um, just, just sort of that humiliation and that sort of breaking down your identity. And colonizers use a lot of those same tactics, right? Humiliation, you're not, you're not truly people, you're savage. Um, we have the right to do with you what we want. Um, and so those, those same tactics you see on sort of a meta scale with colonialism are very much what individual victims of sexual violence experience. One of the things that the book is clearly very interested in is um, addressing this problem. And you, you draw on a concept that's central to American Indian thinking and American Indian political discussion, which is sovereignty. Mm -hmm. But you have a particular definition of sovereignty. Tell us about that definition. Well, I think there's, there's a political, certainly political, definition of sovereignty, and it's very simple. We take it for granted uh, when we're talking about state or federal governments, mm -hmm. and that is simply the ability to make laws and be governed by them. Mm -hmm. It's not a particularly complicated concept. Mm -hmm. When we start thinking about that in the context of tribal nations, it becomes fraught, right? Because the, the various kinds of powers a state government might have or a federal government might have um, are, are not, um, we don't recognize the same kind of sovereignty when we talk about tribes. Mm -hmm. And so tribes have really struggled to make laws and be governed by them, even though they did it for 10,000 years prior to contact. Mm -hmm. In the same way, um, an individual has certain kind of self, personal sovereignty, which again sort of connects my, my analysis of how rape and colonialism have similar flavors. And in this case, I think from a personal standpoint as a rape victim, I've lost sovereignty of myself. Somebody else has made decisions for me. Mm -hmm. My body is not my own. And so I think we have to talk about both this political concept, but also from a rape victim's perspective, what sovereignty can mean. You claim that for tribal nations, defining and adjudicating gendered crimes is the purest form of sovereignty. Tell us why. Well, that's certainly one of the more provocative mm -hmm. statements I make in my book. Um, we look at, with tribal, tribal nations today, we suffer from a lot of maladies, and people will often identify them very quickly. Alcoholism, mm -hmm. poverty, mm -hmm. unemployment, suicide, right? Those are the things that people will point to. But when we look at the data carefully, we see that behind suicide, for example, trauma is the precursor. Mm -hmm. Sexual assault is one of the primary forms of trauma on Indian reservations. Um, and so if we really want to get at these fundamental problems that tribal communities struggle with, we have to be really honest about what the origin of a lot of those struggles are. And sexual assault is part of almost all of those maladies, hmm. particularly the physical health and the emotional health and mental health of Native people. So when you're talking about legal responses, mm -hmm. um, there's obviously significant differences between uh, the, the tribal justice system and the federal justice system, in particular around this topic. Say a little bit about those distinctions. Sure. Um, well, tribal nations, of course, there's over 560 tribes in the United States, and each is going to have an independent tribal judicial system. The real problem that I think we have to confront head on is the, um, the inability of tribes due to unilateral legislation that restricts their authority tribes really struggle with being able to take a sexual assault case and really treat it the same that you would see in a state or federal court system because we can't sentence to lengthy sentences and we can't prosecute 
non-Indians. And so there's sort of a, a, a sort of a hole, a sort of a vacuum in many ways for tribal nations that are trying to address violent crime. There are many tribal sovereignty activists who reject engagement with the federal systems that help create the problems that they're seeking to address. Mm -hmm. But you make the case that that you that working with the federal government to reform the damage systems is the way to go. Say why mm -hmm. you think that's the right approach. Well, if we really want to make sure that tribes can take on these crimes on their own terms, mm -hmm. right? We have to undo some of the federal harm that's been done. Mm -hmm. So there's federal statutes and federal case law that says tribes cannot do X, Y, Z. If we want tribes to be able to do X, Y, Z, we have to repeal and reform those federal laws. Now, I respect people who say, why would we go to Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. to solve a problem that the federal government created? And I actually you know, believe that that sort of activism is very valid, and I respect it. Mm -hmm. As a wannabe prosecutor, though, you know, I think my instinct is to say, we need tribes to be in control of what happens when a violent crime occurs. And the only way that we can make sure that happens is if we repeal federal legislation. So that's my justification mm -hmm. for engagement at that level. So let's talk a little bit about federal legislation. There are two acts in particular I'm interested in having you tell us about. The first is the Tribal Law and Order Act of 2010, and the second is the 2013 Reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act. How are those relevant to this uh, process and this problem? Well, we've started to do exactly that, chip away at these unilateral um, laws that don't allow tribes to take action. Mm -hmm. So the Tribal Law and Order Act, one of the significant pieces there is that we were, <laughs> we were able to convince Congress that we as tribal nations should be able to sentence an offender to more than a year in prison, which was the mm -hmm. limitation prior to that. So we went from one year um, to three years. That's the longest amount that so three years was a victory, believe it or not, because it took years and years and years of lobbying and, and, and um, activism to, to change that. Mm. So a lot of people look at it from the outside and they're like, hey, you didn't really make any changes at all. But it's like, well, you weren't there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> all the meetings on the Hill, all of the, you know, de all of the hearings, et cetera. Um, so that was, that was the three years that we got. And with the, with the reauthorization of VAWA in 2013, we now are allowed as tribal nations to prosecute certain non-Indians, hmm. which was not the case um, as of 1978. Between 1978 and 2013, tribes were prohibited from prosecuting a non-Indian for any crime. Mm -hmm. It could be child sex abuse, it could be arson, it could be rape. Uh, and now certain kinds of non-Indian defendants can be prosecuted in tribal court, but it's a very narrow category of offenders. Like only people who commit acts of domestic violence, where there's an intimate partner relationship or a former intimate partner relationship, um, and so those domestic violence offenders who are non-native can now be prosecuted in certain tribal courts, but that does not include sexual violence. Mm -hmm. It does not include child sex abuse or mm. even drug trafficking or drug manufacturing. So it's a, a really narrow sliver. But again, the years, the heart, the soul, the sweat that went into that lobbying um, was tremendous. So it may seem, again, somebody looking from the outside in, like, why didn't you ask for more? Oh, we did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but this is what we were able politically to achieve. And the idea is once we sort of can show Congress that tribes can be trusted, mm -hmm. uh, for lack of a better word, um, to prosecute non-Indians, uh, maybe we will be able to expand that narrow category to include rape and child sex abuse and, and any crime, really. I don't believe that tribes should be restricted mm -hmm. uh, prosecuting non-Indians for any reason, but it goes slow in, in Congress. Mm -hmm. So both of those acts uh, are passed during the Obama administration. We're now in a new administration. Yes, yeah. <coughs> Do you have any sense, and do the, the activists and the people that you work with have any sense of w the Trump administration's position or view on these questions? We have just a little bit of a clue. Um, we know that, of course, this administration is very much about law and order mm -hmm. and very much about punishment. 
Mm -hmm. And so we have seen some movement just in the last week with, within the Department of Justice uh, that has said we need to make sure you know that we bring the hammer down mm -hmm. uh, uh, in Indian Country. But, but our Attorney General voted against the Violence Against Women Act mm. um, with a philosophy, I guess, that he didn't think tribes should be able to prosecute non-Indians. So what I fear, and it gives us a little premature, what I fear is that it's going to be more of, um, say, a, uh, an emphasis on federal prosecution again. Mm -hmm. We need to have federal prosecutors throwing the book at these guys. We don't need to worry about whether the tribes can do it or not. Mm -hmm. And so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out in the next few years. I, I don't think tribal issues are a priority mm -hmm. for this administration in any way, shape, or form. So it's going to be um, keeping our eye <laughs> on the ball and, and seeing sort of what kind of damage might be done. Hmm. So I'm going to shift uh, topics a little bit. Um, you've come to the U of O to provide historical and cultural context for Louise Erdrich's National Book Award winning novel, The Roundhouse, which as I mentioned is the common reading for uh, incoming first year students next academic year. From your perspective, um, what's important about how Erdrich's novel portrays the issue of sexual violence in Indian country? It, is a, it, it puts a human face on the, on the tragedy. And I actually used the Roundhouse, I taught the Roundhouse as a law school text. Oh, interesting. Because it's that accurate. Mm -hmm. it, it could be a work of nonfiction mm. um, because it so beautifully articulates the, both the resilience and the trauma in tribal communities when it comes to sexual violence. So I assigned it to my law students. Mm. And through the book, I was able to get them to understand how the law, you know, we can read the law in the abstract and we can say, oh, this statute doesn't allow tribes to do X, Y, and Z. But for students to really understand the human impact of those laws, mm. um, I couldn't find a better text. And so that's what I used to teach my own students. So that's how much I think it, the accuracy is, um, is profound. It's interesting to think that uh, this is the way you want to educate uh, law students, and I'm interested in how the impact the book is, will have on students generally who sure. are not and and younger. Obviously, these are first year students, right. so this is a, this is a fascinating way of educating um, a, a much broader population about these problems than law students. Absolutely, yeah. I think it's a great choice. Obviously, I'm a biased <laughs> observer, but uh, I think that exposing particularly um, 18, 19 year olds to Native history mm -hmm. is incredibly important. It shouldn't be relegated to the you know ethnic studies department or the Native studies department. Everybody should know mm -hmm. about this history and the trauma that Native nations continue to experience. Mm. So the um, at the end of your book, um, which you're finishing, um, and you talk about this phone call that you got. Yes. So, so you get this <laughs> phone call. <laughs> Tell us that story about this phone call that you received. Um, well, the, the, the short, uh, the short uh, moral lesson is that you should go ahead and answer phone calls, <laughs> even if you don't recognize the number. I had, uh, I had the misfortune of inheriting a phone number which once belonged to a, someone who did not pay their uh -huh. bills. Uh -huh. So I was um, not answering phone calls that I didn't recognize because I figured it was a bill collector for somebody I didn't know. Um, but in this particular case, the MacArthur Foundation called three times in a short span of time. And so I thought, well, this is a very persistent bill collector or it's somebody that really needs to get a hold of me. So I went ahead and answered that phone and that's when I got the news. They um, asked me first if I could speak privately, which I thought was kind of an odd question. Um, thinking maybe they were looking for a reference for somebody <laughs> else. <laughs> and so I closed the door of my office and they said, we're calling to congratulate you as a 2014 MacArthur Fellow. So this thing has happened to you. So uh, this is a couple of years ago. How has it impacted your the work that you do? Um, well, it's allowed me, frankly, to develop a financial stability for myself and mm -hmm. my family. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're paying off student loans these days until you're 50 mm -hmm. or, or later. Uh, so I was able to, to put that behind me and really get that financial stability, which allows freedom. It allows for you to be more creative when you're not worrying about, you know, everyday bills. But it, it also elevated my profile and made me more famous, I suppose, mm -hmm. um, so that more people are reaching out to me to speak at events like this mm -hmm. and um, want me to write more, you mm -hmm. know, want me to, to do more. 
So it's a platform. And what's nice about the platform is I don't, there's no benchmarks that I have to provide to the mm -hmm. uh, foundation <laughs> itself. But a unique fellowship. Very yes. unique. Because <laughs> most of the time you're filling out, you know, <laughs> paperwork every other day. This one is different. So um, I've, I've been able to like sort of meditate on a few ideas and not have to worry about, will this be successful? You know, can I prove that this will happen the way I'm thinking? Mm -hmm. um, so one of the ideas, for example, is to develop a curriculum around Muscogee studies. Mm -hmm. So some tribal cultures have developed their own sort of unique version of ethnic studies that focuses on their own tribes, epistemologies, and philosophies, worldviews. Um, there's nothing like that for my culture. Mm -hmm. And so I've worked with a number of other scholars of Muscogee descent. Um, who are coming from a wide variety of disciplines, including geography, uh, speech language pathology, mm -hmm. but have a unique Muscogee twist on it. Mm -hmm. And so um, one of my goals is to develop a textbook for Muscogee studies that would be all written by Muscogee people. Hmm. And that's uh, one of the projects that the MacArthur Foundation money has allowed me to think about and really pursue. Um, that I wouldn't be able to otherwise. So we have about a minute left. This is my last question. Um, I know also uh, from reading the end of the book that one of the things that you've thought about is, um, and I know you've begun to learn Muscogee, which you didn't know. Correct. And I know from our discussion and from reading the book that language is important to you. Okay. You think words are significant. So say why it's important for you to learn your uh, tribal language. Well, there are so many legal concepts and philosophical concepts that are embedded within the language mm -hmm. um, that, that don't have an English translation. Mm -hmm. There are so many words in Muscogee for negligence. Mm. Uh, there are a variety of different reasons for that, but um, the idea is, and I, again, I'm putting sort of my legal academic hat on, is there are many more causes of action mm -hmm. <laughs> in the Muscogee way of thinking mm -hmm. than there would be in the Anglo-American legal system. Mm -hmm. There's a negligence that deals with the fact that you, you don't use your eyesight correctly or your balance correctly or you're not listening or you're not believing or, you, you know. So there's all these concepts of negligence. Um, and if we can start to tease those out and perhaps revitalize those into our own court systems, I think we're going to be able to um, not only save the language, but perhaps save some of our sacred legal conceptions of the way we must relate to one another. Well, on that hopeful note, I want to thank you, Sarah Deer, for talking with us today. It's been a real pleasure. Well, thank you. I've been speaking with Sarah Deer, professor of law at University of Kansas School of Law. Her latest book is The Beginning and End of Rape, Confronting Sexual Violence in Native America. In June 9, 2017, Deer gave a talk at the U of O's Many Nations Longhouse titled The Nonfiction Version of the Roundhouse, A History of Sexual Violence in Indian Country. The university's 2017-18 common reading for incoming first-year students is Louise Erdrich's novel, The Roundhouse. Thanks so much for watching.